Welcome everybody to the Jewish Community Relations Council. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jeremy Burton. I am the executive director. We're delighted that you can join us today as in our continued series of conversations with civic leaders that we at the Jewish Community Relations Council and our network of agencies partner with, work with on various issues of concern to the organized Jewish community here in Greater Boston. And we're particularly delighted today to be able to sit down with Congressman Jake Auchincloss to talk about his priorities for the country and our Commonwealth. Uh, many of you uh, who are part of our leadership will recall that in February, we met with the Congressman during his very first month in Congress for a wide ranging conversation with leaders from our many member organizations. And we covered a wildly diverse range of topics. So the Congressman has already gotten to know a bit about JCRC, our 40 member organizations and the diversity of views at our table. And in the wake of the insurrection on the Capitol on January 6th, there was certainly no shortage of things on his mind, all of which continue to be of great concern to our Jewish community. Today, we're opening up the conversation, having it in public. And not only do we wanna hear about the Congressman's priorities, we also want him to hear from us, the organized Jewish community, about issues we care about, what is troubling us in this moment, and how he can be a partner and an ally. We have a few questions that have been submitted in advance by our member organizations, but we also wanna encourage all of you to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen as well, and we'll try to get to those. And now I'd like to introduce Congressman Auchincloss. Representative Jake Auchincloss was born and raised in Newton, Massachusetts. After graduating from Harvard College, he joined the Marines where he commanded infantry in Afghanistan and special operations in Panama. He continues to serve as a major in the Marine Reserves. When he returned home, he continued his career of service, becoming a three-term counselor on the city Newton, in the city of Newton before being elected to Congress in 2020. In his first term in Congress, Congressman Auchincloss serves as the vice chair of the Financial Services Committee and as a member of the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. We'll include his full bio in the chat. Congressman Auchincloss, welcome to the Jewish Community Relations Council. We seem to have lost him. Here we go. Welcome. Jeremy, thank you for having me. It's so good to be back with the JCRC. And today is a special day, not just because I get to speak with the JCRC again, but because it is the Marine Corps' birthday, 246 years as the nation's force and readiness. And I am uh, one of the small band of, of Jewish Marines uh, out there. And this day is especially significant to me, not just as a Marine, uh, but because my grandfather, uh, was a Marine as well. And Jeremy, as you've heard me say before, uh, the Marines gave my grandfather his opportunity in life. 1942, he was a 17 year old son of emigres from the Russian pogroms in Chelsea, walked into a Marine recruiting office, tried to enlist, got dragged out by the ear by his mom, uh, snuck back in the next day and took their academic test, nailed it, and they sent him to Purdue to study engineering. And that was the shot he needed in life. He took that degree and, and went on to become a, a, a world-renowned researcher and scientist and surgeon in orthopedics and bone formation. Uh, and many of the opportunities I've had in life have been born from that fateful decision in 1942 at a time when the Marines were losing the war in the South, South Pacific at a time when Jews the world over were the subject of a genocidal campaign for this country to invest in a 17-year-old skinny poor Jewish kid. Uh, and today, I think about the investments we're making now for the next generation to continue that proud legacy, to continue to honor the core American idea that the circumstances of your birth should not, should not determine the condition of your life. Boston is again, as always, a wonderfully diverse, greater Boston, I should say, a wonderfully diverse mix of native born and immigrant Americans uh, from all corners of the world, from all uh, sets of beliefs and career paths. And we are best when we are empowering uh, the ingenuity and the collaboration of these individuals. And that is the work we're doing in Congress right now with the bipartisan infrastructure bill and 
uh, with the Build Back Better Act. These bills, and I'll go into the policy behind them because I do think it's important to share what we've done, but the core thesis is creating a more fair, a more prosperous, a more inclusive American economy in the 21st century so that everybody has a chance to live their fullest aspirations. We are investing in the roads and the bridges that connect people to jobs and services. We're investing in the water that kids and families drink every day. We're investing in transit so that uh, urban centers and suburban areas as alike are uh, fused together in, in climate-friendly ways of getting around. Uh, we're investing in high-speed internet the electricity of the 21st century, because without access to the digital economy, we're gonna leave behind uh, people in parts of this country in the increasingly competitive 21st century. Uh, and then going forward with the Build Back Better Act, we're gonna create a comprehensive social security for kids. Uh, one of the Democrats' great achievements in the New Deal and the Great Society was to put a floor under the standards of living that we were willing to accept for adult and senior citizens throughout this country. But kids were not part of that initial package. And starting with the Children's Health Insurance Plan of the 21st century, and now advancing with the child allowance, with child care subsidies, with early education for every three and four year old, with affordable housing, which is an underappreciated component of kids' success, stable housing, we are, as a nation, declaring that we have a strong standard for the quality of life and for uh, the trajectory that we want every single kid in this country to have. And I'm immensely proud of that. To me, it is the core, the core of the Build Back Better agenda. So uh, today I reflect on the Marine Corps birthday as a, as a Marine. I reflect uh, on my grandfather's story in this country. And I think ahead to how we're going to ensure that everybody has that same investment, frankly, whether or not they serve in the armed forces, just by virtue of being an individual with dignity and with potential in this country to allow them to flourish. Uh, th thank you, Congressman, and certainly uh, the vote the other night. Um, we're very pleased uh, by many, any aspects of that bill that we care about and obviously are good for Massachusetts and good for the district uh, and look forward to many other things. And we'll get into some of them maybe uh, later in our conversation that would be in the Build Back Better or in other investments in infrastructure and needs here in Massachusetts. Uh, but I want to go to something that I'm gonna say is unfortunately of particular concern to us as a Jewish community. And I say unfortunately both because it is a rising problem, anti-Semitism, and a particular problem because it doesn't seem like a lot of people necessarily are speaking out quite as much as we would hope. And frankly, um, we need allies as a community. And you, you, know, you, know, you are obviously a member of our community. Um, you know, I'm reminded um, you were with us in July um, uh, when, Rabbi Noginsky was stabbed only a few blocks from your district. And the next morning uh, you were, and I'll be honest, the only member of the delegation who was able to be there in person uh, at that gathering with the community in Brighton. Uh, it's not the only uh, incident of violent anti-Semitism that we have seen in what is your district in the last couple of years. And there are a lot of levels of that. And I'm curious, um, and I think all of us are curious to know, what are your thoughts about rising anti-Semitism? in the Commonwealth, uh, what we ought to do about that and uh, how we can engage others as allies in this work? It's a critically important question, Jeremy. And by most metrics today in this country, it's the most prevalent hate crime is, is hate crimes fueled by anti-Semitism. We need to, at the first, have a working definition of what anti-Semitism is. And true to form for the Jewish community, there's a wide ranging and vigorous debate on that. Uh, I've been a strong proponent of the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism, have signed on to uh, various uh, uh, letters and, and advocacy materials in support of that definition, because I think it's a very good one. I think it's a very strong definition of what we consider to be anti-Semitism globally. We need to track anti-Semitism, and that's why I've uh, worked with others in, in Congress to, uh, to really demand that the FBI director track anti-Semitic hate crimes with high fidelity and high precision because we need to know the scale and the scope of the problem that we're dealing with and if there are patterns amongst it that, that point us to solutions. Uh, we need, of course, to actively combat anti-Semitism and the particularly uh, vicious, violent forms of it. And that is why the grant program passed in last term of Congress that provides funding for uh, for, not, for institutions that could be the subject of, of anti-Semitic attacks is so critical. And I, of course, my office and I are, are here to work with 
uh, synagogues and other institutions that may be subject to these attacks to get this grant for security funding. I know that most of the synagogues at this point in my district now have security at their, um, at their gates, unfortunately, a necessity these days. Uh, and then I think probably most long-term and, and most, uh, and most important maybe in, in really in, in the long-term is just the education. Uh, I would think that we would all be shocked, although unfortunately maybe not, uh, I, I should, maybe I should say aghast, maybe not surprised at how few high school graduates in the country today know what Auschwitz is. Uh, it, it is an alarmingly high number. Uh, and, and because of that ignorance of the genocidal history against the Jewish people and the millennia long cabals and, and uh, tropes that surround the Jewish people as this sort of globalist, money hungry conspiracy that's always exercised in the levers of power behind the scenes. I mean, it, this has surfaced from ancient capitals to medieval Europe to today. And we need to be educating and fighting against it at the levels where people form their political and intellectual consciousness in high schools and in college campuses. Because what I'm seeing today is the casual mainstreaming of anti-Semitism, where people say things or people dig into tropes without actually even, I think, sometimes understanding the genesis of their opinions. And that to me is, is incredibly alarming. Uh, we've seen this happen to the Labor Party in Great Britain, where anti-Semitism was casually mainstreamed. It was unexamined. It became increasingly salient from their very highest leadership. And then uh, it became a crisis. And the Democratic Party in the United States needs to be introspective that that could happen to us too. That could happen to us too. It could happen in the Republican Party, same thing. Both parties need to be examining their flanks to ensure that we do not allow that kind of rhetoric or mindset to infiltrate into our mainstream conversations. I'm certainly on guard against it and having these conversations myself. I very much appreciate uh, everything you just said. I imagine that uh, there are probably 20 other questions that are coming up in the audience just in relation to some of what you covered here. Uh, I do want to like particularly note uh, with regard to the uh, IHRA definition of anti-Semitism, thank you for your support of that. We at JCRC certainly support uh, the use of that definition for education, for engagement, and for understanding the varieties of anti-Semitism. Uh, and we always like to express when it comes up in conversation, our appreciation uh, to uh, President Obama, then President Obama, and then Secretary of State John Kerry, who led the way for that to be adopted by the United yes. States and by the international uh, community as a, as a tool for education. I think that's important uh, to remind people as we continue to hear a certain amount of noise around uh, how it gets utilized by some, and certainly does it emphasize both left and right wing versions of anti-Semitism. Um, so I think that's an ongoing piece of education that we is a great tool for us as a community. So thank you for mentioning that. And also thank you uh, for your support for the nonprofit security funding. Uh, it has certainly been a huge benefit uh, to institutions at risk in your district, as well as uh, throughout the Commonwealth and uh, more recently as they've expanded the availability. Um, and I just, you know, just mentioned that uh, in the next budget, we hope that it will be increased from a 180 million fund to a 360 million fund. And I know uh, particularly given the threats in your district that the community uh, will appreciate and value whatever leadership you can bring um, to that continued investment. Without question, supportive of that, yes. Great. Um, two pieces of legislation um, that I wanna mention uh, that are related to rising hate and anti-Semitism uh, that are being advocated in particular by our members at the Anti-Defamation League are the Domestic Terrorism Prevention Act and the Pray Safe Act. Uh, and those are specifically uh, tools uh, to help the nonprofit sector, to help both the, uh, you know, the federal government through the Domestic Terrorism Prevention Act, through DHS, DOJ, and FBI, to effectively monitor and analyze hate, and in the Safe Prey Act, the Prey Safe Act, excuse me, uh, to really help nonprofit institutions, and particularly religious institutions, uh, to be uh, properly trained and understand and have access to the resources necessary. Uh, so I would ask you, if you haven't had an opportunity to look at them yet, uh, to take a look at them, I know that the ADL Regional Office would love to follow up with you on that and would welcome your support on that work. Absolutely. It's related to our advocacy with the FBI director. And I'll just add a, an addendum to, to those two issues related, is, which is gun violence more broadly. Uh, I think we, we've got a gun violence epidemic in this country. We are in a qualitatively and quantitatively different place than the rest of the world when it comes to uh, gun violence well, on a per capita basis. And 
that's a problem at its just at a fundamental level. But for the Jewish people, it is it is of course a problem with particular salience because uh, the, the those who would who would mean harm to the Jewish people, uh, they, they know where to find us, and they are their access to weapons of war. Uh, increases the threat level by an order of magnitude. And so gun violence broadly is, is also important for the, for the Jewish people specifically. I appreciate you saying that. And maybe um, one, of the, one of the things that comes up for me is that uh, this is an area where we in Massachusetts are fortunate to have done somewhat well yes. in the sense that uh, we have very strong uh, state level gun violence prevention legislation, something that JCRC worked very closely with many other allies on. Uh, you know, certainly the that does not mean that uh, we are in a good place everywhere in this country, to say the least. And certainly um, here in Massachusetts, uh, there continues to be concern about uh, interstate commerce when it comes to that. Without question, my friend, that. my friend, State Senator Cindy Cream really deserves a lot of credit on this. She's uh, she represents Newton, Brookline, and Wellesley. She's the Senate Majority Leader, uh, uh, and a Jewish politician like me, and and really has been out front on gun violence in Massachusetts. And I think part of her. Uh, really her impact at the state level has been some of the best gun safety laws in the country, probably the best set of gun safety laws in the country. Absolutely. She's, a, she's certainly been a real champion on so much of the agenda. Yep. Um, you, because you mentioned Senator Cream, um, you know, I, I noticed yesterday she, along with two of her colleagues, introduced a new mental health uh, bill at the state level. And I'm not asking you to comment on a uh, proposed state legislation that was just filed yesterday, but I would like to come back to, uh, you know, your introductory comments about Build Back Better and the investment in both uh, physical and human infrastructure. Yes. Uh, you know, mental health uh, issues, uh, which she is leading on at the state level, is a you know, serious concern for our community. Certainly, you know that we have a wide network of human service agencies like Jewish vocational services, Jewish family services that have um, struggled to meet the de increasing demands over the last year and a half uh, with everything that's going on. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little more about the Build Back Better, what we can expect to see there, what you're hoping to see there specifically to address uh, the human service needs. Jeremy, as you know, and I think probably a lot of our listeners know, I represent a diverse district, Fall River to Brookline, uh, rural, suburban, urban, uh, geared towards Providence, geared towards Boston, uh, red parts, blue parts. But I'll tell you what, the single most common issue that I hear raised when I talk to constituents uh, in small groups is mental health for kids. The number one, north and south of the district. It has always been underfunded. It has always been underaddressed. The pandemic has crystallized the issue. And we are short, not just of inpatient services for kids, but also community-based and outpatient care as well. Really trying to work with parents to address uh, mental health crises and the roots of mental health illness at their base. I won't go through the litany of legislation that I've signed on to in, in sort of individual form that it's it's legion from but the core thesis behind all of it has been treating mental health with the same dollars and, and frankly the same respect for the for the professional practitioners of it that we treat physical health. Massachusetts is the world capital of uh, medical care and life sciences. We should be the, the world capital of mental health care. And at this point, to me, what that means is just taking the lead on surfacing it, addressing how widespread it is, and then providing high quality, uh, high quality care. A big portion of that to me, and I've been very clear about this for the last year and a half, I think we've got to recognize that um, kids need to be in school full time. We cannot close the schools again. And that's important academically, but perhaps even more importantly, it's it's a critical socio-emotional function for, for young kids in particular to be with one another. We cannot close the schools again. I appreciate that. I know that's a, I'm, I'm hearing as well, like certainly our parents especially are very mindful of that. And also in the workplace, I mean, and I say this as an employer, we can't get back to, you know, being fully present in the workplace, work, workplace without, you know, addressing childcare and school openings. And this is what Catherine Clark and, and, and Elizabeth Warren and so many others have been so outspoken on for, for years now is childcare and early education. It is critical, of course, for kids. And I think that's self-evident for most people. Uh, really the highest impact public dollar spent is on early education for kids. One of the, probably the part I'm maybe most excited about with the Build Back Better Act, but it's also just good for the economy. I mean, this is a business issue. This is a workforce development issue. Uh, this is a labor force participation rate issue. 
uh, high quality child care, high quality early ed, uh, wraparound programming for our schools. This stuff is just is just a rising tide for all boats. I would just, uh, to the extent that uh, when you are working on that or leading on that, I know that we and our member agencies, particularly combined Jewish philanthropies and uh, Jewish family services, Jewish family and children's services, would love to work with you. Always. Um, and also to make sure that any effort, you know, investment by the federal government, you know, is really accessible to all children um, and all childcare. Um, so listen, you, you know, JCRC, we've had this conversation before, we're gonna switch gears and we're gonna switch gears wildly uh, yep. and move on to and talk a little bit about foreign policy for a while. Yep. Uh, so uh, the questions are starting to pile up in uh, the Q&A, and I encourage people to continue. Uh, but let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about Israel and the Middle East. And let me start by noting that you recently introduced legislation to enhance cooperation between the United States and Israel in the field of artificial intelligence. So maybe we start this conversation by tell, uh, inviting you to tell this community a little bit about why you're getting behind this issue, how we as Americans benefit from enhanced cooperation with Israel and what the US-Israel relationship means for you. When I, before I was a member of Congress, I worked for two years in a cybersecurity startup in Boston. And one of the things you learn very quickly working in cybersecurity in Massachusetts is that uh, we're just copying and trying to catch up with what Israel has already done on cybersecurity. There is tremendous economic potential in Massachusetts for collaboration in cybersecurity. And the same thing is true for AI, for digital health, for, um, for, for technology related to water potability and resilience. These are areas where the Israelis really have a sharp technical and scientific edge and where cross-pollination between the Commonwealth, I mean, the United States broadly, but the Commonwealth in particular in Israel redounds to the benefit of both economies. And a joint AI lab, uh, I, I think, uh, gets the best and brightest together and really turbocharges that economic cooperation. Uh, I would also add that what, one of the areas I, I've been pushing really hard for is to resume the direct flight between Boston and Tel Aviv. Uh, that is a really important element of getting Israeli entrepreneurs interested in Massachusetts versus New York City. Oftentimes they're deciding between the two. And vice versa, getting Massachusetts investors and entrepreneurs interested in Israel. It's really important just to be able to say to them and their families that you're gonna have easy access to one another. I'm happy to say Delta is gonna start direct flights between Boston and Tel Aviv three times a week in, I believe in May of 22. That's a real win for the Commonwealth. Absolutely, I'm, I'm, I certainly as someone who uh, has taken the direct flight a lot over the last decade, or actually less than that, that it's been up. Uh, it's a real benefit. It just makes it so much easier to interact and bring people back and forth. And I'm really glad that there's a commitment to bring it back. Um, you know, I, I want to follow up a little bit and, and push and maybe urge you a little, um, because I know you've written about this topic. You've talked about this topic elsewhere. I, can you speak a little bit about sort of your own personal connection, not, not just the Massachusetts Israel economic partnership, but what that, what the, what the U S Israel relationship means to you um, both as a member of the community and as a member of Congress, where this gets debated? Well, most fundamentally, of course, it's, a, it's the Jewish homeland. And uh, I am a proud Zionist. I believe in the, in the pursuits of Zionism and that the Jews should have their homeland and that the United States needs to have an unshakable, unequivocal commitment to the security of Israel. Uh, that is, first and foremost, uh, a moral alliance. It is also one that is strategically and economically impactful. You know, Israel is uh, the strongest and some might say the only democracy in the Middle East. It respects uh, civil rights. It has an independent judiciary and a free and vigorous press. In many ways, it's an exemplar of the values that the United States has inculcated here for the last quarter millennium. And it's strategic import I think is especially strong now that we are withdrawing from Afghanistan and Central Asia and have increasingly pulled back from engagement with Iraq, uh, a strong Israel is our best insurance policy as a country for the stability of, of the Middle East and Central Asia as the United States pivots towards the Indo-Pacific. Uh, the Abraham Accords and uh, just Israel's increasing diplomatic and security uh, intertwining with its, its Sunni and Shia neighbors is a really critical way to contain Iran and to 
um, by proxy exercise American influence in the region in a positive way. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate you bringing up the Abraham Accords in particular, which just, you know, we just marked the first anniversary. It's a monumental step uh, towards normalizing relations between Israel and many of its neighbors in the region. And I think it's a, an important thing to be invested in uh, and in its success. Um, I want to like sort of unpack that a little further and also invite like sort of like the two layers of this, which are like, you know, Israel's success and its future in relation to, it, to its neighbors. Uh, so what you mentioned the Abraham Accords. And I wanna explore what else the United States can do to build upon those accords to encourage further normalization in the region. And then after that, we'll talk a little bit about the two-state solution and, the, and our work in terms of supporting that particular piece of uh, Israel's relationships in the region. Yeah, that, that first question about the Abraham Accords is really the thesis behind the Israel Relations Normalization Act, which I co-sponsored along with Representative Schneider. Uh, which calls on the State Department to put together a strategy for how we build on the Abraham Accords. The Abraham Accords, as you said, are a significant milestone on the way towards normalization in the Middle East, but they are just a start. It is, uh, it is largely about uh, sort of economic and, and security silos. There's much to be done on people-to-people -people relationships and cultural exchange. And we would like the State Department to be reporting back on the status of normalization within each Arab state and what can be done uh, to, to create stronger organic ties between the respective civil societies of these nations. Because that ultimately is our long-term best hope is not just intergovernmental exchange, not just military cooperation, as important as those are, uh, not just trade, as important as that is in, in creating billions of dollars worth of mutually beneficial uh, growth for the region that, that ties people together, but really increasing cultural comedy between these nations because uh, so often they talk about one another in terms of caricatures and really there's, there is common ground to be found, but it has to happen face to face. Um, appreciate that very much and thank you for lifting up that legislation and the role that Congress can play in supporting normalization in the region. Uh, turning to uh, specifically Israel and the Palestinians, uh, you certainly know that we are uh, supporters of a two-state resolution to be negotiated directly between the parties. Uh, it is, you know, not uh, exactly a out there thing to say that there are increasing numbers of people on the far left and on the far right who are challenging the two-state solution. Um, there are certainly members of Congress at both ends of the ideological spectrum who are taking steps that probably are detrimental to a two-state solution. There are also actors in the region who are taking steps that are detrimental to a two-state solution. You know, I'm curious, you know, you know, whether you have any thoughts about what steps you as a member of Congress can take and what the United States can take to specifically encourage the parties to work towards a two-state solution or to, to be more, to be more you know, broad, to build the conditions on the ground that make it possible to achieve a two-state solution. First and foremost, to, I, I need to remain a proponent of the two-state solution. As you said, what, what used to be a pretty rock-solid bipartisan consensus is getting a little bit shakier. I wouldn't overstate it. There's, it's still, still pretty solid. Uh, I believe a two-state solution is the best prospect for delivering a just future for the Palestinian people that respects uh, their rights and aspirations for self-determination and a thriving civil society and their own security, as well as what's best to ensure a democratic Jewish homeland into the future. Uh, it is our best path forward. I think Congress uh, for, needs, to needs to maintain its bipartisan footing when it comes to Israel as much as possible. I think the worst case scenario for the security of the Israeli people, and, and really I would say even more broadly to the, to the pursuit of a two-state solution, is that it becomes a political football as so much else has in our country. And to this end, I, you know, the former prime minister of Israel addressing Congress and earning the moniker as, you know, the 51st Republican senator, I, this stuff is not helpful. This is not helpful. This should be as much as possible a bipartisan consensus in much the same way that um, the Good Friday Agreement is between Britain and Ireland. That is something that has the, had the support left and right for 25 years. And that matters. Countries notice that when it when they know that regardless of the administration, there's strong guardrails put on what can happen because of, of Congress. So we, we gotta maintain a bipartisan footing to Israel security uh, as well. And I also think we should be supporting 
just as we should be pushing back when, when Israeli governments are, we think are politicizing the issue more than it's helpful, we should be supporting Israeli governments that are trying to be creative and productive. I think this current Israeli administration has tried to shrink the conflict as much as possible. Uh, there are obviously, of course, existential issues that, that are not going to be solved right now, but they don't have to pervade every aspect of the economy, of civil society, of diplomacy. And they are trying to shrink that conflict, find other ways, other channels to work with uh, their Palestinian neighbors. And uh, I think that's a healthy first step. I certainly agree with you. And you know, I know we're using some terminology that may not be familiar to everybody. I want to take the moment to make a plug for a book, uh, uh, Micha Goodman's Catch 67, uh, which is specifically about this idea of narrowing the conflict and focusing on fixing what yeah. can be fixed and addressed even without a negotiated uh, resolution. Um, and it, you know, Micha Goodman is an Israeli uh, thinker and writer who um, some of the folks here will be familiar with because of his connection with the Hartman Institute, uh, which is a really just amazing think tank. Uh, again, switching gears, but staying overseas. Uh, let's talk about Iran for a little bit. And I, you know, I'll, I'll open this conversation up by saying um, I was struck by some comments you made uh, to the Jewish insider recently. And look, look, I think you know, you've touched on this. Our community is of many minds about how the US should deal with Iran. Uh, but there's certainly a uniformity of um, opinion that it is an essential US interest to prevent Iran from attaining a nuclear weapon, even if there is very loud, vociferous public disagreement about what is the right path for achieving that objective long-term. But in your comments in the Jewish Insider, and I was really struck by this, uh, you talked about the importance of any future agreement undergoing Senate review as a treaty. And that was the word you used, treaty. So I'm curious how you are thinking about the US relationship with Iran, how you are looking at this work and how you are thinking about sort of the US as engaged in the region and that language. Yeah, well, I mean, it's not how I'm thinking about it necessarily. It's how James Madison was thinking about it. He was very clear that when the United States engages in binding foreign pacts, that gets a two thirds approval by the US Senate. That's that's the Constitution. Uh, what has happened really since Vietnam in the last half century is an increasing power grab by the executive versus Congress when it comes to foreign relations. That has happened in diplomacy, but it's happened much more, uh, much more acutely in the use of force overseas. We're now in a situation where, you know, to put it bluntly, the president just thinks that they can wage war whenever they want and let Congress know about it whenever they feel like it. And that's not acceptable. That is not what the constitution dictates. Congress has the power to declare a war. Congress has the power of the purse. And we need to be accountable to the people for those votes that we take. If we think it's necessary to launch airstrikes in Syria, if we think it's necessary to uh, wage war over Taiwan, if we think it's necessary uh, to continue fighting in Afghanistan or Iraq, we have got to get congressional approval for those actions. And I, I feel the same way about diplomacy. The Senate needs to step up and do its constitutional responsibility. This is part of a much larger thesis of reclaiming uh, Congress's authority. We've seen the dangers of an unchecked presidency, frankly, over the last four years. And just because you know, my guy's in office now doesn't mean that I just think everything is, we should let them run, run wild. I have enough foresight, I'd like to think, to understand that uh, we have more core constitutional principles at place, regardless of which party is in power. Uh, now, getting into the, to the direct question about Iran, uh, I think we need to see how these negotiations play out starting at the end of the month. Um, I am always a strong advocate of talking. I think we should be talking to our friends. I think we should be talking to our enemies. I think we should be talking to our really, really big enemies. Uh, we should always be talking because uh, without talking, you just are, you're leaving yourself with a binary option of, of peace or war. Um, so I wanna see how these negotiations play out. I wanna see what progress we can make on what are really the three core issues uh, regarding Iran. One is their proxy funding of terror groups throughout the Middle East uh, and the effects that that has on the stability of the region as well as the security of Israel. Number two is their development of the ballistic missile program. Again, uh, very, very uh, critical to Israel's security and to the stability of the Middle East. And finally, of course, is their nuclear program, which uh, is an existential threat that uh, the Israeli government should not be uh, asked to just blindly accept. 
uh, they, they do have a core national security interest in preventing that from happening. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to build on something you just said. Um, I mean, both uh, with regard to specifically Iran, but this broader comment, broader thing you said about sort of U.S. leadership and the role of the Senate, um, because it's a topic that's frankly of interest to me and it's something I've written about. It's also something I think is relevant to other uh, elements of our leadership in the world. And several of your colleagues and, this, and speaker are over in Scotland right now at the climate change uh, converse, uh, conference. Uh, you know, this issue of US credibility and, you know, you referenced, so you said a president of, you know, my president, I mean, you, you know, you can say that, I wouldn't say that, but, uh, you know, let's, let's expand this conversation and make it like a more bipartisan challenge about, uh, yes, uh, in the absence of a treaty, in the Obama administration on the Iran issue, President Trump could come in and quote unquote, rip it up. Uh, that is not the only example of how when the presidency swings wildly from party to party every four to eight years, uh, the US, uh, shall we say, our reputation in the world is um, diminished. Uh, you know, and there are examples like, for example, um, the Clinton administration is signing on to climate accords that the Bush administration then walked away from, or the Obama administration walking away from commitments that were made by, uh, you know, the Clinton administration to Ukraine. I think there's, there's a huge number of examples here. And I guess, you know, it speaks to the need for a stronger bipartisan center when it comes to our international commitments, including climate change, including Iran, including our role, whatever it may come to be on other issues you reference, like Taiwan, which I'll just say up front so nobody get, calls me afterwards, is not on the JCRC specific agenda, mm -hmm. um, although many of our members will be fine. I'm curious what thoughts you have about restoring US credibility in the world beyond just the Iran agreement, whatever it is, should come before the Senate. I think there's, there's, there's largely three areas where the world is looking to the United States right now for uh, both hard and soft power and hard and soft leadership. One is on climate change, of course, with, with COP26. And this is why the Build Back Better Act is so crucial is that it, it puts our money where our mouth is on this issue. It's hard for President Biden to go onto the world stage and encourage developing and developed countries to do their fair share when their view is that the United States hasn't, hasn't really stepped up yet. So we've got to pass these clean energy tax credits, invest in climate resilience, and demonstrate that we are serious about moving to a carbon neutral economy. And that's an example of domestic policy having international overtones. Uh, and the United States needs to also remain the clean energy R&D capital of the world, because ultimately it's gonna be a fusion of government uh, regulation and investment combined with the commercial side adopting just new cleaner technologies out of self-interest, frankly, because they're cheaper and better and faster. And that's why we need the R&D to, to go into overdrive, whether it's fusion power or offshore wind or uh, better batteries, we need it all. So uh, that's number one. And that, that is, of course, front and center these days. Number two is, again, front and center these days, global public health. Uh, the United States has a once in a generation opportunity to uh, invest in public health infrastructure in developing countries, which we know is one of the highest impact dollars you can spend is health and welfare, especially for kids in developing nations. We saw what PEPFARs did in Africa under President Bush. We can do that times 10 now globally with the distribu distribution of effective United States vaccines to countries that are having a hard time acquiring them. And then, and this is really the crucial part because supply is coming online now, is helping them distribute it with a well-paid domestically sourced, uh, well-supported workforce of public health workers who can then be sustained going forward to help with the whole host of public health challenges, whether it's additional vaccines for malaria or others, or just uh, maternal, uh, maternal well-being and perinatal care. There's so much that we can do uh, with this crisis that then becomes opportunity afterwards. And then this leads me to my third point, which is uh, the great race with the Chinese Communist Party. Right now, China is trying to ship vaccines overseas that don't work very well. And in exchange, they're trying to extract concessions that are really debilitating for those host country governments. The United States needs to demonstrate, needs to show, not tell that we're different than, than the CCP. We're going to be giving these vaccines away and we're going to be training their, their host country workforces, not extracting concessions with mining or, or other natural resources. We got to do the same thing on a broader scale going forward. We've got to uh, partner with the ASEAN states in Southeast Asia to uh, 
strengthen our trade and diplomatic relationships with them. We've got to ensure that the South China Sea does not become a Chinese lake, but is rather an international commons for the flow of goods. Uh, we've got to partner as we have with Australia and Japan and South Korea on defense technology and on the US Pacific fleet's ability to counter uh, increasingly aggressive Chinese excursions. So on all three of these fronts right here, the United States has an opportunity to help work internationally and transnationally on the great challenges that, that our allies and, and many of our enemies actually see. Uh, and it, this presidency has a, has a rare opportunity to hit all three of them. Thank you. Um, in the spirit of JCRC, again, switching gears wildly maybe, or maybe not as wildly, um, let's talk about immigration and particularly Afghan refugees. Uh, you know, so this is an area that we at the Jewish Community Relations Council are particularly proud of our own work here. We are playing a leadership role here in Massachusetts, uh, as are many of our Jewish agency partners, particularly Jewish Family Services of Metro West, Combined Jewish Philanthropies, in partnership with Catholic Charities, many others. Uh, we have about 20 synagogues, including many in your district, that are part of a multi-faith infrastructure to welcome families. There have already been eight families who've arrived from Afghanistan that we're now working with uh, to make sure that they are sponsored and housed and uh, receive services and support to be successful in their integration into Massachusetts. Uh, you know, at the top of our discussion, you talked about uh, the uh, anniversary of the Marine Corps. I, you know, mentioned your service in Afghanistan. I am, think we're all very interested to know how you as a veteran of that particular war think about this crisis and think about uh, our role and responsibility as Americans to these refugees. All right, Jeremy, I, on a personal note, I'll say that I, I never feel closer to my Jewish roots than when talking about immigration and, and welcoming refugees. I think it really exemplifies to me the core spirit of Judaism to welcome the stranger into the, into the new land. And I've been so proud to, talk to a bunch of different synagogues as well as um, civil society institutions like yours that are doing so much to welcome the 2000 at least families that we expect to, to be coming to Massachusetts from Afghanistan. Um, we are immeasurably richer as a commonwealth when we welcome immigration, immigrants, excuse me, and refugees. And uh, this is one of the latest chapters in what is a long, long book of our cultural and economic diversity as a commonwealth. Um, you know, <laughs> I, it, it brings to mind in the last month, Senator Cruz, Ted Cruz launched this stunt. Well, he, he, launched, he, he pat, uh, put forward a bill, excuse me, in the Senate that was called the Stop the Surge Act, which said that they wanted to send the immigrants who are on the Texas border to Massachusetts because maybe that'll show those Bay Staters what it's like and they won't be so pro-immigrant if they did that. And I shot back a letter to him that said, I, I hope that's a promise because We've been welcoming immigrants to the Bay State for 400 years, and uh, they're a critical part of our success. So uh, it just shows a, just kind of a core difference in values right now between the GOP and the Democratic Party uh, on how we view immigration. Uh, and uh, the Afghan refugees are, are a special example of really a broader phenomenon. Just to circle back again to the importance of the Build Back Better Act here, we've got a significant sum of money about on the order of about $100 billion to help uh, improve our immigration infrastructure as a country, uh, processing uh, some uh, tremendous backlogs that accumulated over the Trump years when they really just had a policy of negligence to the whole court system and, and the whole bureaucracy behind immigration. We've got to clear that backlog and provide legal certainty to those who have been here for a long time in the United States so that they can get work authorization and they can raise their families without fear. I appreciate you saying that. And I would just uh, offer... Uh... Not that it needs to be said, but if you ever want to have to say it on behalf of your organized Jewish community in Boston, you know, and I say this as someone who, uh, you know, I have traveled to the border states uh, over the last five years together with Combined Jewish Philanthropies. My deputy director has traveled to the border with CJP. Um, you know, I've been there with the now CEO of Jewish Family Services. Uh, we have done work supporting asylum seekers uh, to not be deported and certainly in partnership with the Haitian community here in Boston are very much committed to making sure that we are supporting uh, Haitian refugees coming from there and you know just the impossible situation. So uh, I think it, you, know, you can certainly come out of this conversation, not that I needed to say it, saying to Senator Cruz or anyone else that uh, if you know, refugees and asylum seekers 
want to come to Massachusetts, the organized Jewish community is ready to mobilize and support their sex, su successful integration here. Thank you. Uh, not a doubt about that. So, um, you know, there have been a lot of questions. I've been pulling from some of them in the in the in the Q and A box. But you know, I noticed that uh, you know when you talked about uh, the Labor Party in Great Britain as a warning sign, and you said that the Democratic Party needs to be introspective. A whole bunch of questions ended up in the Q and A. Uh, so I I, I kind of like want to read the room on that and come back to that for a moment, and and sort of ask you in a more general sense, like if you want to say anything more about that, and also to, to just talk about what it's like to be a member of Congress right now in these incredibly difficult and hyper-partisan times? Well, I, I think the first thing I would say is a note of, uh, of assurance, which is that there is a tremendous selection bias in the transfer from the House floor to the TV screens of the American people. A lot of times, it's the loudest, angriest voices on any given issue who are communicating on it. And so there can be, I think, a little bit of a warped perspective on where the Democratic Party is on Israel and on anti-Semitism. Uh, it is still the bedrock mainstream consensus point of view within the Democratic Party that we uh, support strongly Israel security. I mean, look at the Iron Dome vote, very strongly, uh, strong support from both parties. Uh, and that we recognize the dangers and evils of anti-Semitism and cannot allow it to become uh, any type of a sort of by, by virtue of commission or omission, cannot allow it to infiltrate any kind of main mainstream discourse. But that requires vigilance. And as a Jewish member of Congress, I take very seriously an obligation to be one of the first people raising a flag and saying, uh, you know, here's, here's what's concerning about that. And this is your organization, Jeremy, you know, me, so many of us struggle at times, in particular with threading this needle between criticism of Israel and anti-Semitic actions. That's a lot of times in my experience, that's where it's really come to a head. And just to be very clear, criticizing Israel on the, and decisions by the Israeli government is fair game. You criticize every government, including our own in the United States. We have vigorous criticisms of people's decisions. I'm a strong advocate for free speech and vigorous debate and, and welcoming and protecting even speech that drives you crazy because that is how we operate as a country. Um, we just need to be on guard for uh, speech that slides into uh, rejecting the right of Israel to exist at its very core, rejecting um, uh, or holding Israel to standards that are not no other nation in the world is held to or zero or targeting Israel for special opprobrium. Um, and we need to just continue to thread this needle between welcoming and protecting uh, vigorous debate about Israel and the U.S.-Israel relationship, but also uh, understanding that the Jewish people as a diaspora and in their homeland have a millennial-long history of persecution that we need to be cognizant of in these debates because we've seen in the past how easily, uh, how easily what starts as speech turns into, into something much more sinister. Uh, thank you for expanding on that. I know a lot of people wanted to hear more about your thoughts on that. Um, I'm gonna, one last question before we wrap up and uh, I'm gonna hide behind the, uh, I was asked by people who are interested to ask you about this and I hope it's a, a slightly lighter tone, but maybe it's a, maybe it's a interesting deep dive into something else about what it means to be of a new generation in Congress. Uh, people are like, so what's going on with your TikTok? <laughs> uh, I don't think I have a TikTok, do I? I, I so I, can I admit something to you, Jeremy? I do not keeping in mind care. that we're in public with hundreds of people and uh, it's being <laughs> recorded. I do not much care for social media. Uh, a lot of times young people will ask me for advice on getting involved in politics and how they can participate in the great political debates of the day. And my first advice to them will be, let me see your phone. And, I'll, and they'll pull out the phone. And I'll say, delete the blue app, delete the light blue app, delete the Instagram app and go knock on doors. Go talk to your neighbors and go talk to the average citizen in your community. Cause I bet you dollars to donuts you're going to find that there's a reservoir of common sense and goodwill and dignity in that population that is poorly represented sometimes in the way that social media debates the issues of the day. Uh, I did that when I ran for city council here in Newton, knocked 15,000 doors. It is still the most formative political experience I've ever had. It's still how I center myself on questions. And we make a huge effort in the, 
in my first term and, and I know going forward to get out in the district and talk to people on a representative basis and just to hear from them about things. Uh, because it's oftentimes not the supercharged, heated, polarized, intolerant rhetoric that surfaces uh, in, our, in our social media ecosystem. It's sometimes more pedestrian concerns. It's sometimes just more genuine. Hey, it's, it's costing more to do things, or I'm worried about the schools, or uh, you know, I want the roads fixed. Like this is, this is how I center myself. So I guess the short answer is I don't know what's going on with my TikTok but I'm much more concerned with what's going on in, in Fall River and Taunton and Foxborough and Brookline and Newton. Well, thank you for that. Um, okay, so we're gonna wrap up here and uh, just a final question for you before I thank you is uh, what can we do to support your efforts and to work with you right now? Well, I appreciate that question. I, I mean, I think what the JCRC does on a daily basis is crucial. We have such, such a vibrant and diverse Jewish community in the Massachusetts Fourth and indeed in Massachusetts. I, I, uh, I would go toe to toe with any of the 435 congressional districts with the intellectual and political vibrancy of my Jewish constituency. I just, it, and so the, the support that you give me in channeling that and um, being a convener and a voice is incredibly helpful so that I'm ensuring that I represent the values and advance the priorities of the community. And then also your partnership on issues that we have discussed that I think are, are, are especially important to the Jewish people, issues of refugee and immigration, uh, if, issues of anti-Semitism, of the US-Israel relationship and Israel security, uh, continuing to be an intellectual partner as you have been. Well, uh, thank you for that. And we'll be cutting part of that for our next uh, campaign <laughs> promo, I think around here. So really appreciate it. Uh, you've been a great partner. Uh, it's, uh, it's been great to get to know you uh, in the last couple of years as you've been coming up through Newton and Civic civic service and uh, now in Congress, um, really appreciate every time we sit down, uh, the ability to have a thoughtful and uh, candid conversation about a range of issues. And uh, we'll try to come up with at least one curveball the next time we sit down <laughs> that has not been on the agenda before. Right. Uh, so really just thank you, Congressman, for your time. We wish you well and we look forward to working with you going forward. And for our audience, I just wanna remind people that our next speaker is our beloved Israeli educational tour guide, Yishai Shavit, that many of our partners have met on JCRC's trips, uh, that who, he's gonna be discussing his new book compilation called Heartbeats, The Insider's Guide to Israel, uh, kind of his uh, pandemic project while he's been waiting for the tourists and the uh, study tours to come back. We'll include a link in the chat to register and we invite you all to join us again next week. And also just a, a promo that on Monday night, uh, the 29th of, uh, November, which is the first weeknight of Hanukkah, second night of Hanukkah, we're going to have a gathering at the New England Holocaust Memorial at 6.15 p.m. It's part of a national mobilization called Shining a Light on Anti-Semitism, and we certainly invite the whole community to join us there. So thank you again, Congressman, and thank you to everybody for joining us today, and have a good day. It's great to be here, Jeremy. Thank you.